up, everybody? You are listening to the 10 After 7 podcast. I have a very special guest today, Giovanni Meyer, once drafted four spots ahead of Mike Trout in the 2009 MLB draft, and now in law enforcement. A terrific story. Gio, how's it going? Hey, how are you? I'm doing good, man. How's quarantine hit? How are you handling it? Uh, probably just like everyone else, over it, tired of it, ready to get back to normal life. Um, you know, tired of seeing uh, all these new TikTokers that are coming out. I heard you're quite one of them, huh? Oh, I knew you were going to bring this up, man. I mean, what happens if the, the podcast life doesn't work out? Are you going to go back to uh, TikToking? Uh, I don't know if those 200 views are going to work out for me, but... Uh... I'm, I'm working on my dance moves in the process. That's what it comes oh, down to. Hey, I'm not going to lie. The, the dance was look good. The dance was look good. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. So your story, I said it right off the bat. Drafted four spots ahead of Mike Trout in the 2009 MLB draft. And honestly, that 2009 MLB draft is pretty loaded top to bottom. And you being the 21st pick, let's go back to high school. You attended Bonita High School in Laverne, California? Yeah, Bonita High School. Uh, so... At what point did you know that professional baseball was in your future? Um, I would probably say, probably say my junior year. Um, I had a lot of college opportunities and, and scholarships, like uh, sophomore year coming in, and that was kind of like when the scene for me was kind of getting uh, pretty hot, I would say. And then I'd probably say going into my junior year, and definitely at the end of it is when I started hearing. Uh, you know, the rumors and the talks that, you know, I had an opportunity to get drafted and, you know, I was getting pretty high up there. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I would say all throughout high school, it was just kind of one of those things where, you know, I, I was hoping that baseball was going to work out for me. Yeah, and shoot your year when you hit 479, that's pretty damn good. Yeah, yeah, it was a good year. It was a good year for uh, travel ball as well, um, you know, because – Majority of the time, you know, a lot of people like to throw out, you know, just like um, high school stats, and that's definitely important. But you know, especially in the high school scene, uh, travel ball is, is really where you get most of your exposure. Um, you know, travel ball and all the showcases that, that these kids do. Um, but yeah, obviously having a good high school season definitely helps out because obviously you're you're performing when it matters. Um, you know, with your teammates and stuff. So. Yeah, I was going to ask about the travel ball circuit. Uh, was there any, you know, notable players on your team and guys that you faced that now you can look back on and be like, man, I can't believe I played with that guy when I was 17, 18 years old? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, there's quite a few guys. I think our travel ball team was probably, I mean, you could put it up. Well, actually, you could put it up against any travel ball team out there. I think uh, our starting nine win the first two rounds. Um, I think there's there's a guy, you might have heard of him, his name's Nolan Arenado. He was our uh, he was our third baseman and second baseman and center fielder. Like it was we were so loaded that everybody just uh, played every position because it was almost like everybody needed to get a chance to be seen. Um, but yeah, I mean we had a, a Nolan Arenado, uh, Matt Davidson, um, a guy named David Nick, uh, man, Brooks Pounders uh, um, Trace Thompson was with us for a little bit. Uh, and that's all, is that all California kids, or did you guys get a couple kids like from Arizona, Utah? No, no, yeah, we, we we all had Southern California kids. All of us were were from the same area. Wow. Um, uh, you know, either it's Orange County, LA County, uh, Riverside County, but yeah, we're mainly Southern California. Our our travel coach at the time, Mike Spears, um, who has passed away, he was he was ahead of, uh, of everything when it came to travel ball. He was Mr. Travel ball and he just, uh, he knew how to put teams together and he put teams that win. And, you know, obviously it's, you have so many people with talent that, you know, like I mentioned, we all got drafted in the first two rounds, you know, but somehow, some way he, we just, we all got the proper exposure that we were supposed to get. So it was, uh, yeah, 2009 was, was quite a few guys, uh, you know, that, that, that came out of there with some talent. So, did you did you know when you were alongside of Nolan Arenado how good he would be? Because I consider him already hands down the best third baseman there will ever be defensively. Yeah, and I, and I agree. Um, so what's weird is, and even what Nolan would tell you this, uh, he was extremely, extremely overlooked and, and underrated um, in high school. Um, it, it, he just was not getting like the the same exposure. Like just for example, like I was. Like it, you know, it was just his name was never out there. Which to us as a team, 
was like crazy because we knew that like at the time he could hit. He was the same hitter. He has definitely gotten like he definitely had the tools defensively. Um, but you know, if, if you're going to tell me in, in junior senior year he was going to be a six time Gold Glover and be the best third baseman in history, I would have been like, oh yeah, I can definitely see it. But you know, it's probably just been in the back of your mind, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, all of us knew that this guy's being way over, way underlooked. I should say not overlooked. What is it? Overlooked? Yeah, he's being oh, overlooked. Yeah. And uh, it, I mean, it was crazy to us because you know we knew that this guy could absolutely rake. And uh, you know, he he even laughed about it in, in high school. He was a little bit bigger, like he was a bigger guy. He didn't move as well, but the talent was still there. I mean, clearly. And uh, you know, all he needed to do was just keep playing, and you know, keep the, the chip on his shoulder that he still carries with him. And, uh, you know, it was just, we knew that he was going to be a superstar, so. In that team in particular, is there a tournament you could go back to where you were facing some team with future big leaguers on it that uh, you, you were remembered of it right now? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, uh, almost, uh, almost every tournament there was guys. Almost every tournament that we were facing, it was, it was the best of the best, whether we went out to Florida or, um, or Texas, I mean, I remember facing, you know, Matthew Burke and, uh, you know, uh, guys like Zach Wheeler, Jacob Turner. Um, uh, who was the... Uh, were, they still, were, were they still bringing the stuff they are now? Like, was their stuff moving just outrageously when they were in high school? Yeah, so what's funny is that, it's weird to say, but it was just 10 to 12 years ago, which is, it, it seems like it's so short, but 10 to 12 years ago, back then, baseball and the pitching, 90 to 93 was, like, elite, yeah. you know? And this is what those guys were topping out. Like, you know, Shelby Miller, I think, was the hardest pitcher. He was, like, 93, 94 out of high school, and that was absolute gas at the time. Now, if you're not throwing 92, 94, 95 as a high school pitcher, like, you're not even kind of being looked at. That's right. That's crazy. So just within those 10 years. So, like, for us, you know, it's, it's what you're – if you're consistently seeing – like 90, or if you're not seeing 91, 92 as much, then it seems like extremely hard. But obviously, the more you see it, the easier it gets. So for us back then as high school hitters, yeah, like 92, 93 was, it's, it was equivalent to probably what like 97, 98 is now. Um, and that's what these guys were throwing. And, um, you know, Michael Givens, he was a shortstop at the time. Uh, he's the closer for the Orioles. He, uh, he was like the, he was one of the shortstops coming out of the draft. And he could throw like 98 across the diamond. So everybody knew that this guy had a crazy arm and he went to pitching and now he's throwing 98 off the mound. So, um, Steven Mass with the Mets. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, all these names are coming yeah. back to me now. Yeah, that's, uh, that's insane. Yeah. So, you said you started to get looks uh, junior year and uh, obviously going into senior year. At what point did you have to sit down and make that decision between going to a university or going straight to the, straight to the league? Um, yeah, so when you get, when you get drafted, obviously you have an important decision to make and I really wanted to go to college. I, I, I wasn't going to say that I wasn't positive or I didn't have the confidence that I was going to, I was ready for Pro Bowl. Um, and I thought college could help me, but at the same time, asking a, an 18 year old kid who, you know, didn't come from anything, you know, to turn down, you know, over a million dollars, it's just not. It's, it's not it's not a decision that that kid's going to turn down, you know. So for me, it was one of those things where I probably thought about it a little longer than other kids because, you know, they, they signed, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm going for sure. You know, for me, I kind of took my time with it and then, you know, came to the conclusion, like, yeah, this isn't something I can turn down and, you know, start my professional career, so. So going back to draft day, can you obviously you remember the call. How was that like? It was, uh, oh man, yeah, it was crazy. It was uh, the same day as my graduation. So, graduation was like at three or four, like one of those times. I think the draft was at one thirty or two. Um, yeah, I just it was. I was at my house. I had all my family there. Um, I, I wasn't quite sure. We weren't going to have anything at our house because I wasn't quite sure where I was going to go. It, it wasn't a for sure. Like I was solidified to be a first round pick. Um, with my agent, you know, we were just kind of in talks, like, you know, this is what he's hearing. And 
I would probably say like the night before, um, the area scout, who's kind of like in charge of the communication between me and, you know, the cross-tracker, the national cross-tracker, and the, the head scouts in Houston. He, uh, he was texting me a lot. He was texting me and, you know, hey, you know, how are you? How are you feeling? Um, you know, is, is, has anything changed with your sign ability? Meaning, like, do you still want to play? Um, has anything changed? And he just kept asking that. Has anything changed? And I keep, and he was the only team reaching out that way. And I'm like, man, well, like, this guy's reaching out a lot, you know, kind of like the week leading up to the draft. And the same thing in the morning, he just kept texting me. And I kind of like, I kept telling my agent, like, hey, like this guy from Houston just keeps reaching out. And he was like, well, he's like, you know, Houston was pretty high on you, so we'll see. And uh, so we invited some, some family members over, and then, you know, the first 20 picks happened. And I, I wasn't going to say, like, I was watching because my friends were still getting drafted, but it's like I wasn't really, like, uh, obsessed with it. Like, I wasn't really watching the draft like crazy. Yeah. And it was on my TV, of course, but, and then all of a sudden Houston came up and it, it was like, I just had some weird feeling. I was like, man, they're going to call my name right now. So I told all my family to shut up and, you know, they didn't have an idea. I was like, I think I'm about to get taken, which was kind of dumb to say because if I didn't get taken and I'm here, I am looking like an idiot. Uh, and yeah, and they called my name and, you know, it, it, I think it was a shock to everybody, to be honest, because, like I said, we like the draft was on, but we weren't really paying attention. And then all of a sudden, I get called, and it went crazy, and you know, it was a lot of emotion. And uh, so, who makes that phone call to you from the Houston Astros? Was it that scout that was on top of it, or no, no? So at that point, it was uh, it was the um, uh, I can't even think of the title. Well, it was the GM? So it was Ed Wade, okay. and his name was uh, his name was Bobby Heck. I can't even think of his title, but he was the head of scouting. Head of scouting, his name was Bobby Heck. Um, he was, you know, pretty much the guy who dealt with everything between the GM, my agent, and the, and the, and the area scout. So he was kind of the guy in charge, um, him, the GM. And so, yeah, he was the one that called me and, and welcomed me to Houston. And then, like, I think it was like two minutes later, I had, a, like, a media phone call with, like, a speakerphone thing. And that was it. So for baseball, because that's in June, right, when the draft happens, so immediately, don't you have to pack your bags and you go straight to rookie ball? How, how soon after did you have to get that thing going? Yeah, so you deal with, uh, you know, obviously the, the contract of, you know, your signing bonus and, and just other little, you know, stuff that goes within your contract. Uh, so I dealt with that and, you know, we were negotiating back and forth and the one thing my agent knew was that, like, yeah, the money was important to me, but... Uh, I'm not going to be this guy who's going to ask for a crazy amount over what the slide with the slot is for that for that pick. Um, so he knew I wanted to sign. So I signed rather quickly. Uh, we got a deal done right away. The draft was June seventh. Um, I left to Houston June twenty first, and I was playing my first game June twenty third. So within two weeks, I was uh, no longer a high school baseball player, and I was playing football just like that. And you're 18. You're about to move into a minor league city that you probably never heard of. Yep. What was that experience like? That first day walking into a clubhouse as a first round pick in that, so, in that minor league city. Yeah. So look, fortunately, I had uh, my my older brother. Um, he one of my older brothers. He is uh, he was playing pro ball at the time, and I I mean I, I he had told me everything about it, right? You know, he, he had, I had picked his brain about everything. Hey, what's it like? What's the day like? What, what do you eat? So he had gone from rookie ball. He, he was at every level at that point. I think he was in high A. I think he was in high A for the Quakes or maybe in low A in Great, Le- in Great Lakes. Um, so he had told me everything. And I kind of had that to go into it, which was, which was pretty nice. You know, I'm not 18, you know, with, with no idea what I'm about to get into. Um, so, yeah, I, I flew to Greenville, Tennessee by myself, which um, I had done before, but to stay in a, in a place by myself for two months was obviously different. Um, but, yeah, 18 years old, flew to Greenville, Tennessee, started my season. And, you know, I, I was always an independent person, so being on my own wasn't that big of a deal. But the the first rounder thing was, and my brother told me, like, just – heads up, right? Like, you, it's not a big target on your back, but you, you're just... It, they're, you, expect, you, they're expecting you to buy a few dinners, huh? Uh, 
Yeah, a little bit. I mean, at the time, fortunately, we were in Greenville, Tennessee, which I don't know if you've heard of, but it's, I mean, it's backwoods country. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, we had one restaurant, which was Applebee's. Um, we stayed at a Days Inn that uh, I wish no person, <laughs> I wish my worst enemy had done this doesn't ever stay there. Uh, you know, so it's just, it, it, fortunately, we weren't in the glam life already, you know, um, but yeah, you, you definitely get teased a lot, obviously, you know, because in, in, you get your money right away, you know, your first check was, is within like two weeks or something like that, so it's, it, people know that you have that money, and it's, 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 it's kind of a weird feeling, you know, but obviously everyone's very respectful, everyone's professional, they know that it's the business, um, you know, that they know that there's guys in the field that have money and, you know, for the most part, you know, they kind of get over it and, you know, just kind of get to know you and that, that first round or stigma is kind of dealt with, so. So on that team in rookie ball, you go into a clubhouse with a young Jose Altuve and J.D. Martinez, who was in the same draft 20 rounds later. I got to ask you, did you see anything at that point in those guys where you had a feeling that they were going to go on to be some of the best hitters that baseball has seen? Um, they they were they are exactly who I thought they were going to be. To the T. It's I didn't care how small that two way was as my as as my second baseman. Um, JD was an absolute monster. I mean, JD was has been the same hitter since he was in two thousand nine when I played with him. Um, he his setup. I mean, you can see if you go back and watch video, he definitely had a different setup. Um, but his work ethic, his ability to put the barrel on the ball, like it was, it's always been there. And one thing that never changes in baseball is, is, is you, you can hit, you will always hit. And that's just, that's never going to change. The same with Nolan, the same with other guys that, uh, that you can just tell that they were just always great hitters. That's going to continue on with them because you just don't lose that. You know, that's just something that's just. You know, it's just part of who you are as a baseball player. So, and you hear stories about JD where he's like, you when you talk, like hear him speak about hitting, it kind of goes over your head. Like a viewing fan like me, I've heard him talk about hitting, and it's it's bizarre how it dialed is. in that guy is. Yeah, it is, and and that's what's great about hitting is that if you talk to Altuve, it's about as simple as can be. It, it's there's nothing to it other than I'm going to try to put the barrel to the ball. That's it. That's all I'm going to try to do. I got to get really good at that. And then obviously with the talent and it, and because that's all it is, talent and fundamentals and mechanics and confidence and it, the, however you have it, if you're JD, who's a very, um, you know, intricate person and, and, and can talk about all these different things mechanic-wise, you know, it's going to be way different than Altuve. But at the same time, you know, you look at them fundamentally, they're almost the exact same, which is, you know, crazy about baseball, which is what I love about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, Altuve... He was every game. I mean, he was so he was so impressive. It was ridiculous, and you know, I played with him for three years, and it was always I got to get this amount of hits. I got to get three hits today, and it's like what? Like oh, just worry about one hit. That's what everybody says. I just do about one. And it was no. It was always I got to get three or four because I'm short. They're not going to take me serious unless I hit. And everyone was like, all right, go do your thing. And then every time, three hits. The next day, uh, I need two hits today. Boom, two hits. And, uh, like, that's the confidence that, the, that he carried with him. And, you know, he's still the same guy. And, you know, I haven't talked to him in a bit. But, you know, he's still the same person, still the same, uh, same guy. But, you know, baseball-wise, yeah, his talent was always there. So we talked about the first-rounder thing. For you personally, how much pressure did you put on yourself? Um, I mean, a lot of it. It's, it's of whether I wanted to or not, so constantly it was going to happen. Um, you know, you get drafted in that position, you know, you're expected to perform. There's no other way around it. Um, fortunately and unfortunately for me, I grew up, uh, I, I grew up where, you, you know, we had to perform as kids and I, I had to perform in high school. I had a very hard, tough dad that I'm very appreciative of all the things he taught me uh, because it prepared me for that. You know, if, if I was this kid who just was kind of, um, you know, coddled and kind of was always told I was great and, and never was held accountable for my mistakes, then, you know, I wasn't going to be prepared. But, yeah, I mean, I think the pressure was, I mean, it was immense. And it, it was a lot at times. Um, 
especially when you have to deal with failure for the first time. Not a lot of high school kids do that, and that was something I never did. Um, as you just you pointed out earlier, I hit 480 in high school. I mean, I'm getting two hits a game, and you know when you have back to back overs um, at the age of 18 in pro ball with everybody looking at you, you tend to put uh, a little more pressure on yourself than when than really what's needed. You know, when you're hitting a uh, 290 in your first year and you're kind of thinking like, man, I'm not doing very well because I'm used to hitting 480, that actually, that, that plays a bigger part than you actually think of at the time. So, looking back on it, yeah, I, I put a lot more pressure on myself than I should have, uh, but I just think it came with the territory. You also got drafted by the Astros at a time where, I, really, their core went through that system at the same exact time when they won the World Series in 2017, if you want to say they won it. Uh, but Correa came up, Springer. So you were alongside all of those guys, and their trajectory, honestly, Correa, Altuve, J.D. Martinez, those guys are headed straight to the Hall of Fame. So being alongside those guys with that pressure, that's got to be immense. Yeah, well, I mean, what's, what's great about once you get a pro ball is, you know, kind of once you get to a certain level, all the, the first-rounder, the third-rounder, the 20th-rounder, that kind of stops. And at that point, everyone's just playing. Um, you're all teammates. You all respect each other. You're all really great friends. Uh, you know, because at the end of the day, everybody wants to see each other make it. And at the same time, you know, it is, you're playing for yourself. You're playing for the name on your back. You know, you're trying to make it. But, um, yeah, look at your, because I think it was 2015 I played with Correa. Uh, you know, look at your right, and I'm looking at the superstar, and I'm playing second base at, at 22 years old, and he's 19 in double A. Like, yeah, you look at yourself, you're like, man, this kid's an absolute freak. You know, he's an absolute monster. And, yeah, the guys like that, you already know, like, okay, he's going to go to the big leagues very soon. So the pressure's not really there. But at the same time, you're thinking, like, gosh dang it, i got to get going. You know, i got to get myself together and play with him in the big leagues, you know, because he's going to be 20 years old. You're still going to be 23. So, yeah, you run a lot of things through your head that are, uh, that are, that are they're not supposed to be there, but, you know, it's just, unfortunately, that's how we are as humans. You know, we, we overthink things and we put pressure on ourselves that really don't need to be there. In 2012, I'm going to hype you up a little bit. I know the Arizona Fall League is one of the most competitive all the big players have gone through there. In 2012, you played with Mesa, and that team had Javier Baez, George Springer, Jock Peterson, Nick Castellanos, and your 297 batting average led all of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was one of the best summers I've had, or actually that was winter. Uh, that was one of the best winters I've had. It was by far the most fun I've ever had playing baseball, aside from me going out to Mexico. Uh, but yeah, I mean, all those guys, they were absolute insane freaks. Um, believe it or not, I was hitting, I think it was like, probably like three, a little over 310 going into the last game. And uh, I went 0 for 4 and I ended up dropping down to 297. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I used to give them all crap, like, you know, because Javi at the time was a lot younger than I was. And, uh, he was hitting 211. Yeah, but I mean, he has some of the, the furthest balls I've ever seen in my life. And, uh, you know, but the good thing about it is you're around a, a locker room with those guys and, you know, you, you pick their brain. You talk about what makes them great. And, you know, I got extremely close with, with Nick Cassiano. And, um, you know, those are friendships that, like, you know, were, it was just fun to be around. And, uh, you know, the Fall League is just, I mean, there's no pressure there. You know, it, there's it, the stats matter, but they really don't, which is probably why I played so well because – at the end of the day, I knew it wasn't really going to affect me, but it actually, uh, you know, turned out, you know, a lot better than, you know, I was hoping for when I went in there. In that league, I was going to ask you this question later, but in that league, it had to be where you saw the nastiest that you've ever seen. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, that's definitely, that's the elite of the league. Obviously, they, they send, uh, you know, only their top guys there. And, you know, you definitely see uh, arms that you hadn't seen before because it's a mix of every level. So, you know, I was in high at the time, and that was going to be my first exposure to pitchers who were spending the whole year in double-A and some in triple-A. Um, so that was, you know, pretty different for me. But the advantage that hitters have is that it is October. These pitchers just threw 50, 60, 150 innings. Um, they're a little bit more worn down. Granted, they still have 
their elite stuff, but maybe not as sharp. Maybe uh, that 95, 96 is more looking like 92, 94, which is a big difference. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was definitely a, it was definitely competitive. It was a lot of fun. And, um, you know, I was, I was really grateful I had the opportunity to play there. In 2014, you got called up to AAA. How close were you or did you feel you were to getting over that hump and making it to the big leagues? Um, pretty close. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, I wouldn't say the, the hump was as close as it was in 2015 and 2016. Um, but yeah, getting that first taste of triple A and I was 23 years old. Um, you know, you, you kind of start like thinking back to your man, like, and you know, I'm not as, I'm, I'm not as old as, as Houston's telling me I am, you know, I'm looking across the diamond and there's a 28, 29 year old, you know, in his third year in in, uh, in Triple A, he just got called up. You know, and he still, I think the average age of the big leagues at that time was like twenty seven years old, twenty eight. You know, but at, when you're in the system for six years at that time and five years, and you're just reaching Triple A, it kind of like psychologically plays with your mind a little bit. It's not supposed to, but it really does. And you know that that's something that players have to kind of like get used to because they want to make it tomorrow. They want to get, they want to make the big leagues tomorrow. As soon as they get drafted, you know, the, 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 all the, that's all they're thinking about. They're not worried about development. They're not worried about, um, you know, okay, let me just take this one game at a time and I'm going to be where I want to be, you know, in no time. Um, so for me, I, I did the opposite, which ultimately, you know, hindered me. You know, I, it was, Man, I'm 23 and I'm only in AAA. Man, why am I not getting more opportunity? Right, and it's just when you have those thoughts and and that that thought process, you know, it just it does nothing but affect you. And uh, you know, 2015, I kind of got out of that. Uh, I played extremely well. They sent me back to AA, which I wasn't happy about. But you know, I, I did nothing else but perform. And you know, I was supposed to go to AAA at the All Star break, and I never went. And it's just, there was a lot of things where I was just like, man, what's going on? You know, here I am, I'm, I'm playing the best I've ever played. You know, it's just, I'm, I'm the player that they wanted me to be. And it just never happened. And then finally, 2016, I got my opportunity with, with, Houston, with uh, Toronto. And that was by far, I mean, that, that's where I was like, okay, this is it. I'm going to make it. Like, I'm, I'm going to be a big player. This is what I dreamed of. And tore it up in spring training and, you know, everything was going great and then I went into the season and I didn't perform you know and that was it and that was kind of like was there a chance you could make it out of spring with the Blue Jays there was yeah and um, you know there was kind of talks going around that at the time I think it was uh, I want to say it was Darwin Barney um, yeah it was Darwin Barney he was uh, he was going to be the utility guy he was going to be the backup the backup infielder and uh, he was coming down with some shoulder stuff he was hurt and next on the death chart was me. It was me because uh, uh, Devin Travis was still hurt, and it was Ryan Goins, Tulo, and and, and uh, Donaldson. And then yeah, uh, Tra- Devin Travis was hurt. Darwin Barney was like, I think I mean he was there. He was there on a contract, but he was having shoulder problems. So they were kind of like hinting at that I was going to break with the team, and you know it was just like, all right, cool. You know I, I was excited for it. And then, you know, they call me in, they're like, hey, you're going to go to AAA? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely, no problem. And they're like, just do your, th-. I mean, word for word, they're like, hey, just do your thing, and we'll see you soon. I'm like, yeah, sounds good. And I went down, and I didn't do my thing, and I never saw him. So that's just how it goes, you know? You mentioned a utility guy. At what point in the minors did they move you off shortstop, and you started to play third and second? Um, I wouldn't say they moved me off shortstop. It was more of a uh, career choice in terms of just being more versatile. Okay. Um, so I, I, I never stopped playing short. Uh, 2014 was the first time where I wasn't – short wasn't my primary position. I was playing a lot of third in Oklahoma City. Um, and, and that was because we had VR, uh, Jonathan VR at shortstop. And uh, he ended up going to the big leagues, and then I went and moved over to short. Um, and then 2015, in the beginning, uh, in the very, very beginning, uh, Correa was there, and I played second base. 
And then when he got called up to AAA, which was like a month and a half, which was a month and a half too long, uh, I moved over to short. And then from there, uh, 2016, I played all short, um, a couple games here and there at second base, but for the most part, uh, yeah, I was always a shortstop, but I, as a career choice, like just started taking ground balls at third and second, just to say like, hey, look, you know, I definitely could play these other positions. You know, if you guys need me here, this is what I could do. And obviously, like as a shortstop, and if you have a good glove, you can, you're going to be able to play those positions no matter what. Um, but I just wanted them just to know, like, hey, you know, I, I could do this, and it kind of helped me out. So after the Blue Jays organization, you moved on to the Mets in 2017. Uh, you played double A and triple A with that organization, correct? I did, yeah. So I've heard rumblings that uh, you've had time with Tim Tebow. <laughs> yeah, there was a, I, I wouldn't say time, but I was, I had probably like a little over two and a half weeks with him in spring training. Uh, never said a word to him. I mean, we like, in terms of like conversation, we always say, like, hey, what's up? How are you doing? But at the time, that was his first spring training. So he was very focused. He was very, uh, you know, just like head straight on, you know, didn't, uh, I wouldn't say didn't talk to a lot of people, but I mean, he was, he was there for business, you know, and, um, you know, that's just how he operated when I was around him. Uh, I never, we was never around him after that, but yeah, we were, we were together for a little bit. So then, after that, what what was the decision for you to move on to the Mexican League? Um, so I was I was in spring training in 2017 with uh, with the team from TJ in in, in Tijuana. Um, I was there in spring training with them, and I got the call from the Mets. Uh, you know, it's obviously they offered me a job, so I, I went to the Mets uh, after 2017. Um, I had surgery on my foot. Um, I played with uh, torn ligaments in my foot the whole 2017 season. And I knew something was wrong with it. And, you know, I'm, I, I was, I'm not kidding, I was moving like a 95-year-old man. And, you know, scouts were noticing and people were... And at that time, you know, when you're 20... I mean, so I was 27 at the time. When you're 27, you kind of know all, you know all the scouts, you know all the coaches. You know, you've kind of been around for nine years at that point. And they talk to you like, you know, they don't talk to you like a young minor leaguer anymore. So they ask you like, hey, what's going on? Like, why are you, you know, are you hurt? And I'm like, yeah, I think there's something wrong with my foot. And uh, so after the season, I ended up getting checked out. Um, finally, I should have happened, at, you know, at the beginning of the year. But I ended up having something torn in my foot. And, uh, you know, teams had called. and They're like, hey, we heard you had surgery. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, when are you supposed to be done? And I'm like, you know, I won't be ready for spring training. And I, I, at that point, I wasn't going to be ready for spring training. I had surgery in October. And uh, they were like, all right. So at that point, you know, no team's going to call. You know, if I'm not going to be ready for spring training, there's no point signing me, especially as a free agent, because, you know, obviously we get paid more. Um, so I called Mexico and I told them, like, hey, this is my situation. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be ready for spring training, but. I'd love to come back and play, and they were like, absolutely. And they offered to rehab me, and they offered, uh, you know, pretty much just to take me in with, with my foot, and I went to spring training, and uh, they rehabbed me, and I got healthy, and, you know, I played down in 2018 with them. Did you get, more, did it injure it more with you playing on it? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, it, it got to the point where it was sometime, so... Um, in 2015, I got, it's called a plantar fasciitis. Um, I got it in both feet. It was really bad. Uh, I had no idea how I got it, but it was something I dealt with in 2015. It bothered me a lot, uh, but I just dealt with it. 2016, uh, I, I, I told, uh, Toronto about it and they like pretty much cleared it. It was, it was their medical, like Toronto was like 10 years ahead of everybody else in terms of like. Uh, like their medical and just like their strength and training program, like it, they were just they were they were the top, and so they, they took care of me and my plantar fasciitis went away and I was healthy, and then 2017 came and it's just like I felt it come back extremely hard, and you know it was getting tough to play each day and I told the trainers and I was getting treatment and it, I just told them like man something's not right, and then uh, after the season. 
because um, I was I was I was taking a <laughs> I was taking a lot of uh, anti-inflammatories, if you want to say, uh, to kind of help me play. And that kind of masked all the pain and kind of masked all the swelling because after the season, I stopped taking uh, anti-inflammatories and my foot and my, where I ended up having surgery, it just, it's always oh, it swelled up like two times, three times the size. So I, I sent them a picture. I'm like, Hey, there's something wrong with my foot. And they're like, yeah, let's get you in. So I, I ended up uh, seeing a doctor and he told me I had a, it's called the torn plantar plate underneath my foot. And you know, it was a pretty extensive surgery and it was a pretty extensive recovery. So, um, if I would have did it at the beginning of the year, I would have missed the whole season. And I don't think anything would have changed uh, career wise. Um, so it was, it was just one of those things where I'm kind of glad I didn't have surgery because, you know, I was able to play and live in Vegas and kind of, get another year of, uh, of AAA and kind of just, you know, enjoy that time. Yeah, you mentioned earlier the mo- one of the most fun moments you've had on the baseball field was in the Mexican League. I watch the Caribbean series every year. I eat it up. How was that experience like? I mean, I know their fans are absurd. It's, yeah, it, it, it's everything you you read about. It's, I mean, it's absolutely insane. It's uh, nonstop music, nonstop cheering. It's like, it's like, it's a, awesome. fest- it's like a festival, right? It, it, it truly is. Like I'm, I'm not kidding. If I can recommend uh, to anybody who's a baseball fan to go down to TJ and see a Friday night or a Saturday night game. Um, don't worry, you'll be extremely safe. I mean, if anybody wants to, like, it's crazy. It it is. It's like baseball you've never seen before, and it kind of took a little bit to get used to because when I say there's music blasting, it's there's it's nonstop nine innings, and so you can't even hear anyone talk around. Right? Yeah, no, you can't hear anybody. And, you know, because down there, it's their big leagues. You know, it's, it's, that's, that's the highest level down there. And it's the elite of the league down there for that league. So, you know, like anything else, you know, it's the soccer or baseball. If you ever seen a soccer match, they got the flags going and they have everything. I mean, they're not throwing stuff in the field or anything of that sort. And it's not, like, dangerous or anything. But, yeah, it's, you know, it's a, it's a freaking good time. And, uh, you know, I think... We had a playoff game in Monterey, uh, which is where, you know, uh, the big league teams go down to play. Um, uh, I think the Dodgers were there in Monterey. Yeah, through a no-hitter, no big deal. Yeah, see, yeah. No, well, and uh, we were there for playoffs. And I think it was like 26,000, 25,000, loud as can be. Jeez. And, you know, the place is shaking, and you're just thinking, like, man, this is awesome, you know. And, uh, it, was, it was definitely a baseball experience that I, that I won't forget for sure. And that, that's when you kind of decided to hang it up. What went into that decision? Was it your own decision? Was it a family decision? Kind of talk about that. It was um, It was definitely my decision, which was ultimately my family's decision. I mean, I, I wanted to retire after uh, 2017 um, when I had the surgery. I wasn't sure how my foot was going to react. I wasn't sure... Um, if Mexico was going to take me back, I wasn't going to play in Mexico unless it was in TJ because I was going to be able to live in San Diego with my wife. And, uh, you know, my wife and I, we had already discussed that, you know, we wanted to try for kids. And, you know, it was just one of those things where it's like, all right, you know, I'm kind of getting not towards the end, but, you know, just to, in that area where I kind of don't want to be away from home anymore. I don't want to live, you know, away from my family and you know it was just it was great money but at the time it was just it wasn't for me baseball wasn't doing it for me and um you know I ended up uh I ended up getting the opportunity to go down to Mexico and I was like you know what I I can't turn this up you know I'm gonna go down I'm gonna play my you know I don't know if this is gonna be my last year we'll see and I think it was about halfway through the season I was like you know what I I just don't want to do this anymore it was uh it was one of the best summers. Like I said, I lived in Coronado, which, I mean, if you know anything about it, yeah. it's, it's insane down there. It's beautiful. I mean, there's, you know, I was extremely, extremely lucky and, and blessed to be able to do that with my wife. And, uh, you know, she, she ended up getting pregnant and, you know, we were expecting our first son. So it was just kind of like so many different factors were, were leading me to, uh, to retire. And, you know, I spoke to my wife and my family and I, my parents and my brothers. And I told them like, Hey, this is it. You know, like I'm not going to play anymore. 
they were a little upset. You know, obviously my wife wasn't, but um, you know, she was going to support me no matter what. But yeah, it was just a decision that you know it was time. You know, it's just the best way I could put it. It was time for me to move on. It was time for me to. I wanted to get you know a career that that was stable, and I knew what I was getting into every single day. And you know, it was just something I was ready for. And now you're in law enforcement. Did you was that a career that was always in the back of your mind? Um. Yeah, it wasn't necessarily the, the first thing on my mind. But it was a it was a career that I knew if I needed um, something for sure that that was going to be my first choice. Um, I wanted to become an agent. Um, I wanted to be a, a I wanted to stay within the game somehow. I thought about going to, to coach pro ball, and you know because it's it's really hard to get into the college scene. Um, you know you you kind of have to start at the bottom, which which I'm fine with. But at the time, you know, being 29, no education, uh, I have a kid on the way, you know, uh, internships aren't really a thing that uh, I should be looking into, uh, especially when I have a family to provide for. So the coaching aspect was kind of getting tough for me to do. I really wanted to do it. But the agent, uh, the agent scene was something I was pursuing hard, and I had an opportunity to do it, and um, it, it, it fell through. So we were kind of left, um, I wouldn't say scrambling, but, you know, my son was going to be due in a month, and, you know, I had no job. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, probably I had worked for four or five months at, at that time. It was, it was like September, October, November. Yeah, so like four or five months. And I knew it. So I was like, all right, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join law enforcement. I, I knew this was an option, and I'm ready for it, and I'm excited about it. So I talked to my brother, who played baseball and now he's he's been in law enforcement for seven years a little over seven years now he's with uh with our department so he uh you know i talked to him about it he was like dude let's do it he's like let's do it he's like you'd love it you know obviously he hyped it up and uh you know i couldn't wait to do it so i applied and you know i got hired and and that was it you know that's how i got into it that's awesome man i just got a quick uh couple rapid fire questions for you all right all right, all right worst minor league city you played in uh, Greenville, Tennessee. Best player you played with? Jose Altuve. Best player you played against? Ooh, uh, uh, we could say probably Manny Machado. Uh, best pitcher you faced? Max Scherzer. Farthest ball you saw hit by somebody? Uh, Javi Baez in the Fall League. Probably went 400 and, I don't know, 85 feet. Wait, I gotta go back. Max Scherzer, take me through that at that. Uh, three pitches, spring training, fastball, I felt it off. I was like, oof, like I just missed that. Like I got this guy. Uh, slider, slider, take a seat, have a nice day. And uh, came back to the dugout, I'm like I never want to face that again because it was, it was insane. Because it, it didn't matter because at the time, the uh, he, was with the, he was with the Nationals. Or was it the Tigers? No, he was the Tigers at the time. Uh, when he was the Tigers, they know who, like, the young minor league guys are, you know, and the the big league pitchers, they know who we are. So it's kind of like, all right, you know, I'm going to work on this a little bit. Nope, Max Scherzer was like, he grabbed the ball, he got on the mound, and he burned a hole through my forehead. Like, I don't care who you are. I don't know who you are, but I'm going to throw, I'm going to treat you as if you're Alex Rodriguez. And sure enough, he did. And it was three pitches, and I was like, all right, that was fun. And I just went back to the dugout. So I mentioned at the start that you were four picks ahead of Mike Trout. We didn't know who Mike Trout was. I don't know if you knew him at that point, but I did. Yeah, you knew about him in high school. Yeah, well, because he was from Jersey. Okay. So he was from Jersey, and in the Northeast, there's not much yeah, uh, yeah. baseball. So he would come down to Southern California, and um, yeah, he was. I think yeah, if I'm not mistaken, he was split his time between Florida and, and Southern California, but we had like all the big tournaments down here and, and all the big showcases. So I definitely knew who he was. Um, he was definitely on the opposing team sometimes. I think we were on the same team like a couple times. Um, but I mean, his thing in high school was he was he would run like the wind. He he had extremely like he had the shortest swing ever. He would, can run like the wind, but if you're going to tell me Mike Trout in high school was going to be the Mike Trout now, I would. I would say, like, okay, like, uh, I would like to see it. Uh, to say, you know, in my opinion, he was going to be the greatest baseball player in history, I would be like, I mean, that's a, that's a bold statement. Yeah, but, you know, yeah, right, you know, but 
Yeah, in, in high school, he was definitely very talented, obviously. He was extremely, extremely athletic. Um, kid was, like, when I say he could fly, I mean, it was, like, like, it was unbelievable, you know, and it was just, uh, it was impressive. So, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, yeah, it, was, it was cool to see him, see him play. Well, man, I want to thank you for your time. I think your story is incredible. I would wear that with a badge of honor if I was drafted in the 2009 draft. Uh, thanks for coming on, man. I really enjoyed it. No, man, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, man. Have a good one. All right, you too. And there you have it. Great interview with Giovanni Meyer. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I love that stuff. I want to thank him for coming on. You can follow me on Twitter at 10 after 7 or on Instagram at 10 underscore after 7. I'm out. Woo! Go Dodgers.